There we go. Um, but I just like to reiterate what the difference is between a scientific law and a scientific theory. If you've had one of my classes before, then you know that I, I tend to stress this a little bit. Um, and I get to open with a fun Albert Einstein quote. Who doesn't like a good Einstein quote? He has all the best quotes uh, other than Niels Bohr. Um, Niels Bohr had all the quippy, you know, comebacks to Albert Einstein. So I thought he played the dice. Niels Bohr was with Einstein, but it's all about what to do. Um, like they had debates against each other long into the night where they just argued with each other and then their friends slash colleagues with referee who won that debate. Um, so they still have two different interpretations of quantum mechanics because Einstein and Bohr couldn't get on the same page with what the implications were. Um, but anyway, just the general idea that we don't know everything in science, but anything we know about the universe is because of the scientific method, whether we realize it or not. And, and if most people don't realize the science. People think of science as starting at back with the ancient Greeks and Aristotle and things like that. They actually didn't do science. They just argued. It was natural philosophy is what they called it. Um, and they didn't actually do science. They just said, well, this should be true. And that was good enough. And then they just went on their way. The scientific method didn't come along until um, Persians, I think, um, around 1000 AD, where somebody actually wrote down like, well, if we're predicting based on the math and the theory and philosophy that this should be the case, we should probably test that and then write down our answer um, just to see if it actually works. And so that's when science really started happening. And that's the, the key. It's not just making predictions. It's not just testing the predictions. It's changing your theory or your, or your understanding of the system based on what your results are. Right, so in the past, I don't know. So I hear I have very interesting parents um, in that I get a lot of like science. I'm not sure about science because they keep changing what all the requirements are. Like, like everybody got sick of hearing stuff like that from COVID, right? Like, well, the CDC said this, and now they changed. How dare they change their recommendation, right? They're doing that's what science is. We're getting better and better and better as we start making these adjustments, just because science is changing all the time doesn't mean they're doing something wrong. It just means we have a better way to approximate things or approximate how the universe works. Um, and I just, I like this, this is in the textbook as just a, a good flowchart way of thinking about science. Make a hypothesis, make a prediction, test it. If your results are consistent with what you expected, cool, that's, that's evidence that's supported your hypothesis. If the results do not um, match what you predicted, then you change your hypothesis and you try again. So you go in here around and around and around until you get to a point where your results are consistent with the prediction and then you can publish it or you can provide it to the world at large. Um, and so that's they, what they're referring to, it contributes to body of knowledge. Um, and that doesn't mean your contribution will always stand up the way it is, right? Your theory might get changed by somebody else. And that's one of the reasons why scientists can be kind of slow to change how they teach things or um, to accept new theories is because it almost feels like a personal attack. If you've published, if you work years of your life to publish something, and then some young whippersnapper 20 years later says, oh, your data was flawed for this reason. We sh it really should look like this. People get a little bit touchy about stuff like that. Um, it's just human nature. Scientists try not to, but it does happen. They resist change, even in the face of evidence. Um, scientists, like I said, are better than, than the world at large at changing their worldview past a certain age, but it's still really, really hard. Um, but this dichotomy is the one that's most interesting, given the way that language is used and occasionally weaponized, um, theory has become almost a four-letter word sometimes. It's just a theory, right? How many times has somebody said that? How many, you probably said, I know I've said it at some point, because theory means two different things, depending if you're talking about the scientific method or just use of the word theory in the world at large. When you say theory, it's like it's just a theory, 
what that's actually closest to, where am I? Oh, that that'll work. Um, oh, well, that's stupid. there it goes. That's what I want. Um, it's more like the hypothesis. Hypothesis is a prediction, right? This is the way I think it's working. This is what I think is going on, but you haven't necessarily tested it yet. And that's why people treat the word theory in everyday usage, right? And they say it's just a theory. It'd be better if everybody you could get people on board and say it's just a hypothesis. That's a whole two extra syllables, and that's that's a hard sell. Um, the difference between a law and a theory in the scientific term has nothing to do with how well supported the theory is. Does anybody from, from 100 or not from my 100 class want to explain the difference, take a stab at it? What's the difference between the two? Observate or law versus theory, Jacob? One is explaining what's supposed to happen and the other one is what actually Close. I, I think you, you meant it the right way, but I'm gonna correct the wording a little bit. One explains what happens, the other explains why it happens. A law just describes an observation. Like, okay, we don't know why gravity exists, but we know that if I drop an apple, it's gonna accelerate 9.81 meters per second squared towards the ground here on Earth. That's a law. The theory of gravitation says that any two objects with into fermions with mass attract are attracted towards each other. It's explaining why things fall to the ground. The law of gravitation just says that they fall and predicts how fast they fall. Right. So the only difference between a law and a theory is the theory explains why law just says what is going to happen. Right. So seems nitpicky, but given the way that the word theory gets, or the fact that it's called a theory gets used to dismiss a lot of important things, right? The, the theory of evolution gets right. Well, it's just a theory. No, it's it's explaining the law of natural selection. Natural selection is the law, and evolution is the theory that explains how speciation happens, right? So those are two different sides to the same coin. Um, just because it's a theory doesn't mean it's less well supported. Less well supported, more poorly supported. There's not a great way to phrase that. I need to change that sentence. So, so. Anyway, um, what other theories are there that are very well supported that should not be dismissed? It's just a theory. Theory of gravitation, theory of evolution. What are the theories that you think of? Theory of relativity. Yeah, and it's the law, the law would be time dilation that goes along with relativity. The idea of traveling, do things traveling at different speeds are one that time is going to pass differently for them. That's measurable. That's a law. Um, the theory of relativity is what explains that. The idea of space time being stretched out by things that have mass and that stretching causing time to pass differently. That's the theory explaining why time dilation happens. Any other ideas? Any other theories you can think of? So I have two. Jacob, did you say something? Dark matter. Dark matter. Mm, we'd have to get a little more specific to pick that part. We're going to talk about dark matter later. We'll talk about that more. But what was yours? Like quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics. Yeah. So um, Heisenberg uncertainty principle is a law, and uh, it's Schrodinger's Schrodinger's equation is the theory that describes Heisenberg and Circuit principle as a law. Yeah, there's quantum mechanics has got a bunch that we have to dig into more. And again, we'll get when we get to quantum mechanics. I can't wait. I love quantum mechanics. Um, though my students don't always because it's hard and tricky. But yeah, it has lots of theories versus laws in quantum mechanics. And though we can't see it or understand what's happening intuitively because it's so different than the way we perceive the universe. Um, 
Um, there are laws in quantum mechanics, and there's theories that support those laws. Wave particle duality would be one of the laws. We can observe that particles are both waves and particles simultaneously. Um, and again, Schrodinger's equation would be the theory that, that explains why that's the case. Um, it's quantum mechanics is one of those things we have to teach in this class. I enjoy teaching it. I enjoy as a student not understanding it and just wanting to get through it. Um, but uh, I did have just somebody on my evaluation one year to say, if you could just not teach quantum at all, that would be great. Sorry, it's, I got to teach it. And I'm going to enjoy it, if you don't. All right, so let's talk about chemistry more specifically and why it matters, why everybody has to take chemistry since we didn't get to that part. Um, so if you think about chemistry, what is chemistry? Everybody has answers to what you have a preconceived idea of what chemistry is. Um, I just go the really boring route. I just pulled the first definition off of Wikipedia. Um, chemistry is the study of composition, structure, properties, and reactions of matter. Um, the other the other good definition is the one, it's the Walter White one from episode one of Breaking Bad, where he's got the squirt bottles with flame tests, and chemistry is the study of change, but partly. It's also, even when things don't change, you want to know what something is, that's chemistry too. Um, it's just a different branch of chemistry. That's not as easy to do like fun demonstrations with, though, as you know, squeeze bottles full of methanol. Um, so, but if we're going to say that, now we have another thing we have to define, right? So, anybody have a definition for matter? Anything that takes up space? Any other qualifiers? And has mass. Got to do both. And again, the theoretical physicists will argue with each other as if something has mass, by definition, it takes up space. If something takes up space, by definition, it has mass. Not all physicists agree with that, but it's close enough for chemistry. We're not getting into any particle smaller than, a, than an electron, so it works for us to say that one implies the other. If it has mass, it also takes up space. So, since that's everything, we can study anything in chemistry, which frankly is one of the reasons I picked chemistry to study is because I had trouble deciding on a major. So I picked chemistry because I could kind of go anywhere from that. If you get good at chemistry, you can talk to any other science or engineering field. Um, a physicist and a biologist can't always communicate their research to each other. And a chemist might not be able to it can always communicate his research both in both directions, towards the biology direction, towards the engineering direction, towards physics, depending on the mathematician, maybe even towards math. Um, but, and so it's, it's sometimes called the central science for that reason. And really, really interesting things happen, right, at the intersection between different fields. I guess the chemistry is thought of as being in the middle of all of them, but there are some other fields where um, chemistry is less involved, like you can get uh, a degree in biophysics. It kind of cuts out the chemistry side. It's physics of, of biological um, systems like cells, um, which is still kind of got chemistry in it, if you ask me. But for the most part, really, really interesting research happens at these intersections. Um, so we're going to go kind of fast through this since this is normally a day one thing, but I went slow on stuff before. Um, here's a more complete view of all the different types of sciences and engineering that kind of connect with chemistry. Um, sometimes it's a, like a two-way arrow where chemistry helps research in that other area and that research in the other area helps the chemistry research. And sometimes it's more one, one direction. Chemistry doesn't really inform mathematics research. Those mathematicians are so out there that um, they they don't want anything to do with the real world for the most part. So chemistry doesn't help with math with mathematics research, but math research definitely helps with chemistry um, and under can understand some of the math research at least. Um, but this is just kind of a fun way to think about how these subjects are connected. Um, anybody, I haven't read any of the uh, majors yet. Does anybody have a major or a field of study that's not related to one of these or not on there? 
pretty much everybody's going to be in here somewhere. Some of these, you might not even know what they are. You might like the idea of some of them, but you don't even know what it is yet. Um, in particular, material science is really, really cool. Material science is basically how do we make stuff better. Um, so material science is the area where you start talking into how do we make solar panels that are more efficient? How do we take, um, how do we get a coating for cars so that their your paint doesn't doesn't get destroyed up here at altitude? Um, anytime you're trying to improve or develop a new material for some specific application, not always with an application, it falls into material science, it's like superconductors. That's material science, the study of how do we make superconductors or you know what's going on in them. Um, so that's a really, really big area right now. It's all that battery research um, that, that's being done by Tesla and stuff like that. That all falls into material science as well. Um, if you could make the argument that material science is actually is just is chemistry, just with more applications directly. Is that what you're What's the difference between chemical physics and nuclear chemistry? Good question. So chemical physics is the is applying quantum mechanics to the molecular level and studying how like how reactions happen, the shape of molecules, and looking at the physics of what's happening when reactions happen. Um, versus nuclear physics, chemistry is and nuclear physics for that matter is more studying the the individual nucleus of a single atom. And what happens to that if you have certain ratios of protons and neutrons, it's not stable. Um, and so um, nuclear chemistry is all about how to, is where you'll find things like how do we make new elements? That's nuclear chemistry. The answer is you smash the right pieces together, go in the right speed, and you get a new atom. Um, that's all the nuclear chemistry where you're changing the nucleus. And then the word we usually think about nuclear, how do we use that? is things like power plants, bombs, et cetera, um, fusion reactors, that's all going to fall into that category as well. And chemical physics is more about at the molecular level, not at the nucleus level. It's just it's slightly one, one Google Maps zoom out above um, looking at the, the uh, nucleus. All right. Uh, And just to show one more fun way that these things all link together, one of my favorite web comics is this guy, this guy with a PhD in physics from Stanford. He used to do robotics for NASA, and now he just does um, a web comic. He's just an author, a really good science communicator. And So sociologists, so more pure, quote unquote pure. Sociology is just applied psychology and psychology is just applied biology. Biology is just applied chemistry. Physicists, or physicists would say, well, chemistry is just applied physics. None of them are wrong. It's just reductive because they, they do different things. And then way over here, you get the mathematicians. They're so far removed from applying anything that nobody even realizes that they're there. Um, just that, you know, all of these things inform one another. And so being in the middle is kind of nice because you get to be understanding both sides. Uh, and then the, the argument about, uh, well, why would anybody study anything other than physics then is, well, because those physicists have no idea how to actually do anything in the real world because that makes so many assumptions and you know, assume air resistance is zero and neglect friction for this problem. And if you actually want to apply anything to the real world, you kind of have to get into the chem chemistry realm. And if you want to apply chemistry to the real world or to living things, you need biochemistry. Um, so it's it's more of a spectrum, and there's definitely a lot of interplay just about finding where you like to be, and what you think is is interesting to study. All right, going into talking about units and uncertainty. If you took Chem 100, a lot of this is going to be review. Um, hopefully, we're going to go through it a little bit faster, though, and we're going to talk about measuring and uncertainty and sig figs. Um, and the reason we cover this twice is, in theory, if you've had high school chemistry, if you had Chem 100, you've had all this before. Um, the reason we do it twice is because y'all didn't take it the first time. So 
let's do it again. We're going to get better at it. I'm going to be pickier, maybe not pickier on the sig face. It's hard to think pickier than I am in, in Chem 100. Um, but just on understanding what's going on, everybody who had Chem 100 or high school chemistry, you should, even if it's review, you should be able to understand what's going on at a little bit better level because you're hearing it for the second or third time now. Um, so if this looks familiar, that's why. And when we're, if we're trying to not be the math guy off by himself so far divorced from reality that nobody has any idea what's going on, we need units. Numbers don't mean anything without units unless you're in math. So if we need units, we need some sort of context for our numbers. Units are what give that number context. Um, and again, just grabbing a Wikipedia definition. Units are definite magnitudes of physical qualities. So it's a, in other words, it's anything you can measure has to have a unit. And so the units are basically our baseline that we compare things to. Right? You need a point of reference in order for anything to have context, right? You know, if I say, uh, I don't know, I ran 150 floors. Okay, great. What's a floor? A unit doesn't mean anything unless it's giving something context, right? And so that's why we, we spend so much time on conversions and using solved word problems in this class is because we need to be able to put the numbers, measurable numbers, into units we can conceptualize, we can understand. The big picture, units tell us what a number means. If you don't have a unit on a number, it's meaningless, or at least some way of getting something context. Um, you can, like if you had something like, um, 78%. Percent's not really a unit, right? So that 78% is meaningless. Um, unless you, you can use words also to sort of describe what that means. So it's not always just a unit that gives the context. Um, but if there's no unit directly written after it, you need some other sort of description. 78% water by mass is different than 78% on your final exam is different than 78% on body fat by mass. I can do that. Um, but again, without the context, numbers mean nothing. That's not what I meant. So another example, you go to the gas station, you pay in cash, you have to give a unit or you're implying units by the way that you say something, right? You can buy $50 of gas, you can buy 50 gallons of gas. Changing that unit changes what you're asking for, right? If you just walk up to the gas station dependent, you're paying cash and you say, okay, I'll take 20 on five. But you're implying units in there just based on context and based on everyday experience. To be most specific, you would say, I need twenty dollars of gasoline on pump number five, or twenty gallons of gasoline on pump number five, to give those numbers for, um, any sort of context. And for medication, medication always needs to come with a unit um, because that's otherwise that's how you wind up with people overdosing sometimes um, on on anything really, right? If you're taking ibuprofen, you need a unit to know the dose. If I say, go take four ibuprofen, four milligrams or four tablets or four grams, right? You need the unit attached to it in order for that to make any sort of sense. All right, so we'll start from the basics from the, the first real units that were ever established were mostly units of um, used for estimating distance, length units. Historically, and, I, and now I'm kind of thinking about the anthropology of it. Um, I, there, there's lots of, of uh, uh, theories about civilization beginning and things like that. I don't know actually historically what the very first recorded unit discovered was. Um, but it likely would have been somewhat related to length, ones that we have that are the oldest are length. So, what can we use for length? 
it could have been a day, could have been moon, moons, maybe even months, but the, and even then they probably would have distinguished between like a month with a moon and a, and a sun is a day or something like that. If they didn't have the term day. You know, the Sumerians recorded a lot of like tree quality and stuff. That's a better way to record. They did, but even before they could do that, they had to have a way to record it, which means they had to have some way of measuring things like how big their clay tablets were. Um, they were the ones who used cuneiform, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have um, Sumerian is really interesting because they did all their writing on clay tablets and then they fired the clay tablets. So they're really, really well preserved. We have lots of records of the Sumerian culture as a result, even though there were likely other civilizations at the same time just as advanced. We don't have records of those because if they wrote on something like cloth or paper or papyrus, um, it's long since decomposed. Um, so the Sumerians are really interesting and logically for that reason. We have lots of details. Trying to think. They're also one of the ones that, that led to the uh, um, assumption that part of the reason that we stopped being hunter-gatherers and settled in one place was likely because of fear. The first cities and villages that were permanent settlements instead of being hunter-gatherers um, was so that it was agriculture related, but it wasn't because they couldn't find enough food being hunter gatherers. It was because they couldn't reliably get grains to make beer. Um, so, in, in a lot of ways, it's been said that beer is responsible for human civilization. And it's very good state, I suppose. Um, so, what are we actually going to use for length in this class versus what we use in everyday length? Metric system, which means Meters. meters. Actually, metric is short for meter. And where does the word meter come from? What's the etymology there? Anybody know? <laughs> Literally means a way to measure things. So a meter, like a speedometer, or a tachometer, or any time you're measuring something, that device you use to measure it has meter tacked on to the end. It's not because it's somehow evil in metric, but because meter literally means measure. Um, so we use meters in this class, but we don't actually measure meters of anything in chemistry because that's way too big for us. So we use more likely centimeters, which is related. Um, why do we have different length units? We can go to, to British units too, imperial units for the sake of, of sticking things people understand. Why do we have miles and feet and inches? Wouldn't it make more sense to just have one? You could, you could, I could, I could make you a ruler that has 0. 0.0002 miles and 0. 0.00004 miles. Honestly, it's because humanity is too lazy to just like do all those numbers. They just, they just want to have just one number they can just pull out. So you're onto something there. Why would you need to do that? Why would you need to do any math? You so you can speak the same language, but so you can process it. What does 0. 0.0004 miles look like? Right? So on the other hand, if I say two feet, everybody's got an idea of what two feet is, right? So our brains are hardwired, only have the firmware really be able to think between about a third and, the, and, the, and when you're less than one, our brain is naturally thinking fractions. Um, we can think well, really well between about a third to three of something. Anything more than three of something, we don't really have a good way of visualizing. Anything that's smaller than a third or something, we don't really have a good way of visualizing. So we switch the scale of our units, and that kind of tricks your brain. There's no reason why two feet should be easier to visualize than 0. 0.0004 miles, other than that's the way our brains have developed and evolved over you know, millennia. So we use these different scale units to measure the same thing. We just try to stay in that range. It's not really reasonable to stay between one third and three. So we kind of try to stay between like between 100 and 0.01. Anytime you need to get something smaller than 0.01, switch units. Anytime you get, need to go bigger than 100 or something, you should probably switch units. Even if you think about a, a number that you know, how many, who knows how many feet are in a mile? 5,280 feet is one mile. What does 5,280 feet look like? A mile. Your brain does that automatically. 
Like you can't help it. Um, next time you try and like, uh, it's it's really really fun to pay attention to the way your brain works. If you try and go to count a pile or something, they like said, I don't know, a bunch of pennies. I dropped a bunch of pennies here, uh, and I ask you to count them. Your brain starts counting by dividing things up into groups of two or three. You can't even have five of something and look at it and see five. You see it group of three, group of two. Pay attention to what your brain thinks next time you look at a group of objects because it's really kind of trippy. Um, if you try to count a group of five or something, five people on a bus, like, no, that's two and three, or two, two, and one. Anyway, that's a bit off topic, other than the fact this is why we have different units. What are we going to use for weight in this class? I'm not going to be super strict on the, well, technically, grams is mass, not weight. Weight is force. Like, that's a physics issue. I'm okay with us calling mass and weight the same thing because I don't think anybody's measuring weight of anything not on Earth. If you are, let me know because that sounds awesome. Um, for the most part, I'm okay with that. So, you know what the so for weight, the British unit is pounds, right? Does anybody know what the British unit of mass is? Not quite close though. Sounds similar. No, that's a metric. The other one, it's it's a slug. A stone is just a larger unit of weight. I think it, a stone is 20 pounds or something like that. It's still weight. Um, a slug. It's literally named after they have a slug of metal. They call it, this is a slug, and this is the mass that it has. And that's what they use to define what a, what a slug was. Volume? Liters? Cubic centimeters? Milliliters? Ounces? Ooh, ounces. Do you want to use ounces? Not if we can help it. Does anybody have to differentiate between fluid ounces and mass ounces? Fluid ounces or volume and mass ounces is mass. Um, it gets really, really confusing. And fluid ounces and mass ounces are the same, but only if you're talking about water. If you're talking about anything else, then a fluid ounce is not the same as a mass ounce of that. So we're just going to avoid ounces as much as possible, unless I'm trying to be tricky and make you think about things. So be careful. Um, if you see me use ounce on anything, that should be a red flag for you. Chris? Um, earlier, did you say uh, for switching units 0.0 or 0.0? Or, I mean, I, I'm not going to be really strict in the way if you're careful with it. If you're good at scientific notation, that kind of gets around it a little bit, right? Because if you start getting used to thinking in scientific notation and counting decimal places, you can kind of use whatever units you want um, because you can use that power on the 10, sort of, that's the main things too. Um, it's not, that's not something I'm going to test you on. Um, but yeah, in general, from like 100 to 100 is like a reasonable, we have ways of sort of approximating that in our head, um, even though it doesn't really do that, that well. Um, like if I think about like 0.78, if I tell you to estimate what 0.78 looks like by coloring in um, a, an object, you're going to instinctively start breaking up into smaller pieces, right? Well, that's really close to three quarters. So I'm just going to turn that into three. That is a conversion too, right? And your brain does it itself so that you can kind of process what that looks like. Or at least my brain does. I guess I shouldn't, I shouldn't assume um, y'all think the same way that I do. But and there are some similarities. What are things that don't have, that have units that are harder to think about or that you're, are less common to think about? Light? What about light? A light year, which is, that's an interesting unit. Where does that actually fall, though? It's actually a light, because you take a light year is the distance that light travels in one year. So at the speed of light, you let a photon go for, for um, 365.24 days. The distance it travels is a light year. So despite the fact that it sounds like a time or something else weird, it's actually a length. It's just a convenient length for measuring the distance between the stars. Um, hertz. Hertz, what is a hertz? Uh, it's not how it has to do with frequency.
frequency. It's, Hertz is a really cool one because it's a unit of frequency. Um, and I guess I'm going to use the not for that direction on the term lights. Sorry. I know. I'm a chemistry teacher. It's my job. Um, one Hertz. The funny thing, Hertz is spelled like the car company. So Hertz is singular and plural. I don't think you say Hertz's, but you also, it's one Hertz and it's also 25 Hertz. Um, it's shorthand for cycles per second or just, you know, how many times something happens in a second. So it's also frequently abbreviated as one over seconds or seconds to the negative one is the same as Hertz. And yet it basically measures how many times that something happens within one second. So your computer that, that has a processor that's 2.4 gigahertz, that's talking about how many mathematical operations your computer can do in one second. And gigas, let's see, megas a million, so gigas a billion. So 2.4 billion mathematical operations per second. Does that have to do with what we said? Amount. Yeah, so it, that, that's where it comes from originally is if you think about a wave, any sort of wave, not just sound waves, um, what Hertz versus wavelength is doing is wavelength measures the physical distance in between two peaks and the Hertz or the frequency is if I stood right here and counted how long it takes from when you go from the top of one peak to the top of the next peak. That's technically period is the time that it takes between peaks. If you do how many peaks per second, now you're in frequency units, and that, that's when you would use Hertz. So Hertz actually gets used all over the place. What about luminous intensity? Luminous intensity? Um, so that's a light unit, that's how bright the light is. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with the color of the light or the energy of the light. Because those that are related, but they're, they're more complicated. Um, but yeah, just I didn't really change the color of the light in here when I turned on the lights. It's about the same as the color of the light outside, right? But by turning those on, I increased the intensity of the light. You have more light. It's the same as the light that was already here. Yeah, luminous intensity or lumens is, uh, is a unit. There's also frequency of light versus frequency of um, sound. Lumens is an S, so you can have one lumen, but it's hertz, you can have one hertz. Just for, because this is kind of fun, anybody have any other ideas for what interesting qualities are there? Oh, sorry, I was gonna say, come on. Yeah, charge, units of charge. In chemistry, we like to do things just in terms of electrons, because electrons matter the most. So we just say it's got a negative one charge, um, but technically there's a physics unit called a Coulomb associated with that. Okay. Yeah, volts and amps, electricity's got its own units too, right? Volts has to do with, with the potential difference. In other words, how, how much the electricity is pushing uh, against something, how downhill it is in energy from one side to the other. And amps is how many electrons are passing through, so current running. Thermal dynamic temperature. Temperature, good. That is one we're going to deal with a lot in this class. So we will actually have to spend some time with temperature units pretty soon. Chris? Operations per second. Per second. So it's going to be something close to Hertz. What, what was the um, floating point operations per second? So flops. Yeah. So flops is, is another way of saying it's, just, it's very, very close to the same thing as saying Hertz for a, for a computer processor. It's, it's a little bit more technical. The floating point operation is a, not quite the same as just a mathematical operation period. But they're really, really close under most circumstances. But you do see computers rated in petaflops and things like that, supercomputers. That's really that's very similar to Hertz, the frequency unit that has a little bit more uh, knowledge and a little bit more explanation of what's going on. All right, last call. One or two more, or we'll move on. If you're interested, there's a whole Wikipedia. Wikipedia has great lists of things. 
um, Wikipedia's got an entire article on lists of, of interesting units or really, really weird units or just like humorous units. Um, some uh, nano, nano scientists or people that were making stuff at the nanoscale um, devised their own light scale that's equivalent to a light year. It's called a beard second. Um, so a light year is how far light travels in one year. A beard second is how far the average male's beard will grow in one second. Um, so it's a really, really, really small distance. It's the opposite of a light year by using the same idea. Um, for a while in uh, in Houston, they were they were measuring people's home runs um, at the uh, Minute Maid Park um, in Altuve's. This was the Altuve's, like five foot two, these tiny guys. So they started measuring their home runs in Altuve's. Um, there's some some other really fun ones out there too. All right, so for the most part, we're going to stick to SI units so here. Barrels of oil is an energy unit. That's the other one. And the other fun energy unit that goes with it um, is um, tons of TNT. Tons of TNT is also an energy unit. Um, just like, so barrel of oil is the oil the energy you get burns 55 gallons of crude oil. How much energy would you release? Um, and a ton of TNT is exactly what it sounds like. You're rating the energy of something by how much energy, like by comparing it to literally, um, it's metric tons of a thousand kilograms of of TNT exploding at the same time, which is kind of fun. Those aren't SI, though, right? Those are not SI, which brings me back to the point. Thank you. Um, for the most part, we're going to stick to SI units, which are SI stand is uh, in French, I believe, System International. I have no idea what how to actually say that in French. I could read it if it was written in French, but I don't know what the spelling is or how to say it. Um, sorry. But SIs. Just short for international units or metric units. Um, and for the most part, they're all based on meters and seconds. <clears throat> um, I guess grams too. These three metric or SI units are the ones that have almost everything else is going to come back to in one way or another or involve these. Um, and I guess temperature too, the temperature kind of measures its own thing. All right, so we'll get spend more time with those uh, in a in a minute. We start talking about about unit conversions, um, but first let's talk about measuring things because we need to get better at measuring things. When you measure things, how do you determine how many numbers to write down? Anybody who's had my class or not, feel free to jump in. If I was going to measure something, if we had an object that was this long, how many digits do we write down? Ronnie? Three. Three? So what would you write down for that? Anybody, you can jump in. 3.45, I heard. How'd you get to the 4.5? Is that a four? That's a fraction. This is a fractional scale. Fractional scales are evil because nobody likes fractions, right? It's like halfway in between. So if that's a half, I mean, that's a quarter, which means that's an eighth. And so it's halfway in between three eighths and four eighths. So it's seven sixteenths. Nobody wants to do that to measure something, right? So we're going to stick to, to decimal scales that are all base 10. Because then if I draw the same object, if it's decimal, that means that you've got 10 markings in between three and four, or that you've got 10 markings in between 0.4 and 0.5. If we had really, really small markings, right? So that allows us to look at decimals and use decimals instead of fractions. If you use a fractional scale, you can't do that. You have to write it as three and what we decide seven sixteenths. We don't want to do that. So what we do instead is we only use decimal scales. 
which means you have to vet that when you're in lab. You have to check that whatever you're asking to measure something is actually using a, a metric or a, sorry, a decimal scale. Most of them do, but occasionally they're tricky. Occasionally you'll see something. Oops, that's not what I wanted to be quite one. <laughs> if we had a ruler that has three inches and four inches, and it has assume those were all the same length. Is that fractional or decimal or neither? Decimal. It's kind of decimal, but it's not. So remember the deci and decimal stands for 10. So there's not 10 individual markings, right? I broke it up with putting four lines in there. I broke it up into fifths. So it's kind of fractional. It's kind of neither. It seems like it should be decimal based on this. It's not half and then half and then half again, right? So occasionally, though, we still have some glassware in the lab that breaks things up like this. Or if you had, say, um, a beaker that has markings for 200 and 100 and One fifty. It counts by tens is decimal. So it, this ruler here is decimal in the ones place, and then it's fractional in the tenths place, or in the smaller than a one. This is decimal in the hundred milliliters, and then it's fractional in the 50 in the tens of milliliters, right? So where that last decimal point is, or where that last decimal scale is, I should say, determines how many digits we can write down. All right, so if I go back to this, we have this marking right here, this object, same, these are still inches. Who remembers how we can measure it if it's a decimal scale for the tenths place? Anybody? I hope I didn't scare my old students from talking by saying they were bad at measuring. I just said I managed to rephrase. Need more practice. No? So what what would we write down for this measure? We're measuring an object that goes to right here. If you can see it, I can zoom in a little bit more. Three, it's definitely three something, right? 3.4. We can all agree it's really close to 3.4, right? Yeah. So when we when we do this, we always go one spot past the last decimal marking. You're allowed to use your judgment for one decimal place, past the one where everybody's sure. Everybody's sure about the ones place. Everybody's sure more or less about the tenths place. Somebody might look at it and say, well, it's 3.39. But everybody's going to agree it's really close to 3.4, right? We couldn't be off by an entire tenth. We're off by at most a little bit, maybe a hundred. So always use your judgment when you're measuring, but only for one decimal place. And so the best way to write this measurement I guess I can even say the correct way to write this measurement would be 3.40 inches or 3.39 or 3.41. You, you or I might disagree with what we put in that last spot because I did have to use my judgment and you have to use your judgment, which means this last digit has some uncertainty associated with it. These ones don't. The ones place in the tenths place, we are pretty sure about those. That one is where the uncertainty is. That, that's where we used our judgment. And so when you're writing down something, you go to the last decimal scale, and then you estimate one decimal place past that, or one, if it's, if it's not less than one, it's so called that a decimal place, even if it's not behind the decimal, just so we're all on the same page there. So if I go back to, 
my example of the you know, the wrong one. These. If I go back to my beaker that has markings for 200 and 100, pay no attention to the scale here, and 150, the last decimal scale is in the hundreds place, right? So if I had something, if I had liquid in there, and we're trying to measure this using the speaker, we can all agree it's between 100 and 200, right? There's no uncertainty associated with that. We don't have a decimal scale in the tens place though. So when we write down the tens place, that's when we're using our judgment and that's as far as we can go. We can't look at this and say it's 161 milliliters. Because that's in, well, we'll talk about the uncertainty in a second. But because the last decimal place that we're certain of is in the hundreds place, so we can go as far as 160 milliliters, or somebody else might look at it and say, ah, I think that's more like 170 milliliters. Right? That's not, it would not be unusual to look at a situation like this and for two people's estimates to be off by 10 milliliters for somebody to write 160 versus 170 or maybe even 150. It would be really, really hard to be off by a whole hundred. And you, we wouldn't want to say 161 milliliters because we could be off by way more than one milliliter. Right? So that's using our judgment for two decimal places, and that's against the rules. Why well, can't you be certain it's not between 150 and 200? We can, but we can't be sure. We can't write down a decimal place based on, I know it's more than 150, right? That's that's why we try to get away from using the fractional scales. That's thinking like the fractional scales, right? We can look at that. If we're thinking fractionally, we can say, okay, it's definitely more than 150. It's about halfway between 150 and 200, right? So you can say, okay, it's 175. Or more like the better way to phrase it be like, it's one and three quarters of another hundred. But when you start getting into the fractions and estimating that way, when you actually do the division of the fractions, you actually get more numbers out than what we actually are sure about. That's why we just stay away from fractions entirely. Um, because 175 would be implying that we only use our judgment on that one's place. But really we used our judgment on the tens place. If we had a better a better piece of glassware that actually had markings for every tens, now all of a sudden we can all agree that it's between 160 and 170. Now all of a sudden that's not where our judgment is, right? Our judgment would come to the ones place if we were doing that. Right, so this is always how you measure anything in a lab, especially is you go one, you use your judgment for one decimal place. The rest of the decimal places you write it down, you have to know for sure that everybody that looks at it won't read. Right, going back to that, that um, 3.40. Like, and when I say, and everybody knows for certain about the tenth place, Okay, yes, it might be 3.39, but we're not off by an entire 10. We can all agree that it's going to be really close to 3.4. That's what I mean by that. And not that it has, we've never changed the 10th place, depending on who measured it, but just that you're not going to be off by an entire 10. All right, so last thing before we take a break no fractional scales. Only decimal scales. If you can't count 10 individual markings, you can't use that decimal, that place as being 100% certain. So that's where you're going to have to use your judgment. Right? And so stuff like beakers, stuff like um, where you've got hundreds marked, every hundred is marked, but you don't have markings for every 10 millimeters. That's going to be where it gets tricky. And that's why we are very specific about what glassware we use in lab. 
because when we want a lot of numbers written down, we want to know with a lot of precision what a measurement is. Sometimes you've got to change how you're measuring it. You can't just use the same measuring tool for every situation. All right. We'll stop there, take a break. Let's come back at five after. We'll do some practice with this. And then we'll start talking about math with these measured numbers.
I'm splitting hairs once you get that. More. I think it's the same length, but it's a little hard to tell. It, but it is a good, it's a good, um, it's a good illustration of the fact that that looks like it's really close to 4.5, right? But if you put the same object against something that has more markings, it's very, very clearly closer to 4.6 than 4.5. But we never look at that or see that. That's part of that. Your brain thinks in fractions. Your brain looks at that and says, what's, it's definitely really close to a half. So I'm going to say 4.5, even though it's closer to 4.6. So if we have this better ruler, we would look at that and say 4.5 something. And that's where our measurement, where our, our estimate comes in, right? That's where that uncertainty comes in. And it's just more than not just the first time I've used the word uncertainty, we're gonna spend more time talking about it. But just so we have a frame of reference, uncertainty is of a measurement is basically how far off it could be in either direction. So if we're looking at this one, we know it's, that's that, if you know it for certainty, or you know, it's definitely, there's no way anybody in their right mind could look at this and say, it's not between four and five, right? Can we all agree on that? So we know it's four point something with certainty. And then we're estimating the spot past that. In the uncertainty, we usually assume you could be off by 10% of whatever the, the digit is that you estimated. So whatever number we write down, the last digit you write down, or if you're reading somebody else's measurements, you're assuming it's plus or minus one. You could be off by 10% from whatever the last number is that they wrote down. So if we wrote down 4.5 for the top one, we're implying we might be off by a 10. It turns out that's that's pretty valid. This is the same object because it's really close to 4.6, right? If you've measured A and you wrote down 4.5 and it was actually closer to 4.6, to me, that's the same number. If it's a measured number, it could be off by, it's more like there's like this gray area there. Where five is our best guess. But if you close guess anything close to five or six, that's good enough. That's where we're using our judgment there. If it's off by one in the last digit that you write down, that really is the same number for the purposes of this class. And same when you're doing your homework, even if you're working with, with other people and you all started from the same numbers that I gave you, but the way you plug them into your calculator and round it, one of you got an, an answer that was 4.56 and somebody got an answer that was 4.58, that's the same answer. You just round it a little bit more. That's why we associate uncertainty with that last digit and why we care about where we round. So I'm partly saying that just because when you start doing math problems and you start saying, well, we're doing the work together and our work looks the same, but we're not getting the same answer. I hear this every year and then I look at the two answers, it's 4.58 and 4.56. What do you mean you're not getting the same answer? That's the same number, it just looks a little different. It's another reason why mathematicians don't like sciences because we do things like that. Um, if we had our better ruler, we can estimate one place further, right? So we would say it's four point what? Four point. It's close to four point six, but we can, if we look at it, I guess depending on on how what good your eyes are and where you're sitting. Okay. To me, to my eyes. From sitting right up here, my nice good perspective, it looks like it's definitely between 4.5 and 4.6. So I'd say it's 4.5 something. So 4.58, 4.57, 4.55 even, depending on where you're sitting. Those are all valid measurements. It's more about what place did you go to because that determines where we round down the road, right? That's going to wind up being important if we want to get actual numbers that um, where we're not, we have not just have a final answer for a problem of just a four. If you want to have a four point something, you want to have more digits, 
you want as many digits as possible when you're doing your measurements. But we also are stuck with the rules of we need to make sure we're not over and we're overstating how certain we are. Um, if we're dealing any, with anything digital, um, here's good luck because the engineers, for the most part, who design anything digital that we're going to be using or anything that you see in everyday life, know these rules. Um, and actually, there's actually an entire um, part of the, the the federal government dedicated to standards that, that dictates how many decimal places people are allowed to put on things. The gas pump that goes to the thousands place um, for your for gallons of gas, that's regulated. They're not allowed to make a gas pump that goes to the 10,000th place unless they actually are that accurate, unless they can justify that last place. So with that in mind, anytime you look at your Apple Watch and it's talking about how steps you've taken today, things like that, or your heart rate for that matter, that, that last number is assumed to be plus or minus one, at least. Sometimes they'll explicitly say plus or minus 5%, um, which can be more than the number of digits that they, that they actually are reporting. Um, but it's, it's an important part of science and engineering so that people don't take your numbers as being better than they are. Um, you know, if, I, if I'm planning a road trip, I said the mileage of my car is 25.28 gallons per mile, and I'm planning down to the penny how much I'm going to spend on gasoline. Um, that's not really going to be accurate, right? Nobody's car is at that constant of mileage, right? So by over-representing my certainty there, it makes it harder to actually plan things using that number. Or it means I could be off by a lot more than I think I could be. Right, so that's just just one example of, of a place where this comes into play. Um, I believe the, the does anybody remember when that Mars Mars uh, lander um, the parachute didn't inflate in time and it smashed into the surface of Mars instead of, of uh, actually landing properly and and it came out that that was because some one of the teams was using metric units and another team was using. Um, empirical units or uh, imperial units. And it wasn't that they forgot to convert between feet and meters, is that they did it with too many digits. They thought that they were more certain than they were when they did that conversion. They used a, a bad conversion, but then represented it by keeping too many decimals. And it, you know, millions and billions of dollars later, we now have a very small crater with some circuitry in the bottom of it as a result of that. Um, so it does wind up mattering, despite how really, really boring this can be and how easy it is to mess up. All right. So here's some more practice. Um, these ones are more interesting. Let's practice with these. Anything that has markings for the units has these rules. If it's digital, you just write down the units that are, that are shown here, assume that the engineer did their job properly. Everybody said to try it on their own. Look for the last decimal markings and then estimate one digit past that. What do we do with liquid? The meniscus. What about the meniscus? It's where you measure. Technically, the meniscus is the name for the phenomenon of it not being flat. So it's the entire surface is the meniscus. So we want to 
be a, so I'll be a little bit more specific. We want to measure from the flattest part of the meniscus, which as long as it's water and we're measuring it in glass is the bottom of the meniscus. If it's not water and it's, or it's not being measured in glass, the meniscus can actually go the other way. It looks really weird the first time you see it in person, um, but mercury has a meniscus in, when it's in glass, it looks like that. So that's in, in that case, we'd be measuring from the top of the meniscus, the flattest part of the meniscus. And, but with water, generally it's the bottom of the meniscus. So with that in mind, it can be advantageous sometimes to, to start by just looking, not even trying to measure anything yet. Just look at this and say, how many decimal places am I gonna write now? Where am I writing to? So what's our smallest decimal marking here? What place? So I mean like what is it? Is it the ones place, the tens place, tenths place? We have markings for the ones, which means we're going to write down to the tens. We're going to estimate that last spot. So definitely more than 40, definitely more than 42. It looks like it's pretty close to 43, depending on your eyes and how you drew your line. Um, you might say it's a little bit under 43, but it's going to be something really close to that. So 43 and then if it looks like it's right at the line we still want to show that that's where our uncertainty is right we don't want to just leave it at 43 milliliters because that implies it's plus or minus a milliliter but we did a better job than that so we add a zero even though it doesn't change anything mathematically even though when we plug it into our calculator 43.0 versus 43 is not going to change anything we write it there as a way to signal to anybody are reading our paper, hey, I measured it and estimated all the way to the tenths place. And occasionally you'll wind up um, writing two zeros in a row. Like if this happened to be right at 40, you could write 40.0 or 3.00 for something if it was right on the line for three, right? Think about those places as being how you're signaling to other people how good your number is. So for the protractor here, what's our smallest decimal marking that we have? We definitely have decimal markings for tens. And if we're careful, we can say, okay, well, that, that's halfway. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, that's a decimal marking for the ones place as well. So we're going to estimate 10. So we could look at this and say, and I know it's pixelated and blurry. We could say, okay, let's well, definitely more than 40, definitely more than 45, definitely more than 47. Because the marking for 47 is here, 48 is there. So 47.5, 47.6, somewhere in there. And again, the temptation when it looks like, okay, it's definitely more than half, but it's still really close to half. The temptation is there, it's definitely 40, you know, 47.6 because it's more than a quarter and a half, but it's still really close to a half. You can still write it as 47.5. And, and, but we wouldn't want to say 47.55 or 47.59 because we're not that sure about it. All right, so this is talking more explicitly about uncertainty again. So just to reiterate, or when you're going back and, and studying later, that last digit that's reported always has uncertainty. So sometimes I'll ask questions on, on a quiz or on a test or just in general. Hey, where's the uncertainty in this number? What I'm talking about is what place, not necessarily what is the digit. Like if I was looking at this number and I said, where's the uncertainty? I wouldn't be talking about, oh, it's one of the fives is, the, is where the uncertainty is. I mean, it's in the hundreds place is where the uncertainty is. Or you could even, you can even um, write it explicitly 
by saying, by using the symbol plus or minus. It sometimes looks like that, or sometimes it's written like that. If you want to explicitly say what your uncertainty is for measurement, you'd say like that. So the uncertainty for that middle measurement for B, you would write it like that, plus or minus 0 0.01 centimeters. If we follow our rules, we, we don't have to write that though, because it's implied based on standard condition. We're always talking about, unless you see it written otherwise, assume that it's plus or minus one in the last digit. All right, what would we measure for this case? So ignore the wording for a second, I know that's hard to do. But what's our smallest decimal marking for this ruler? We have marking for the tens place. And actually, this is uh, one where I'm opening it on a different computer, made that shift. It's supposed to be right on top of the 300 mark. Let's see if I can fix that really easily. Right on top of one of the markings. All right, so if we have markings for the tens, and it looks like it's really close to even with the the six marking, right? So it's three hundred and sixty. Yeah, that gets a little bit tricky. How do we say? How do we write three hundred and sixty centimeters? Right? Yeah, centimeters in a way that shows it's plus or minus one and not plus or minus 10. Right, so if you just see 360 written, it's not clear. This is what's called an ambiguous number. Because if you just saw this number with no context, you look at that and say, I don't know what the uncertainty is. It's either plus or minus one or plus or minus 10. So the way we get around that, one of the ways to get around that is use scientific notation. The other way to get around it is by writing our uncertainty explicitly. We could say 360 centimeters plus or minus one centimeter. You say that, that, that is telling people, hey, I measured the lens place. It just happened to be a zero. The other way we could look, we can do that, and this is not the Official way to this, and this only works if it's at the ones place we have this issue. You can write it as people will, will write it sometimes and say 360 and write the decimal point. If you see the decimal point written with nothing after it, that's telling you that the uncertainty is in the ones place. It's not official, the best way to do it. The best way to do this would be to, to write it in scientific notation, because we could say 3.60 times 10 to the 2. The fact that we wrote that 0 in there is indicating that that's where the uncertainty is. Um, and you do have to be careful by using that. That that's approach doesn't work if our uncertainty is in the tens place. So if I wrote a number like um, 172,800 and it was plus or minus 10 six centimeters we're talking about. So the uncertainty is in the tens place. There's no shorthand like throwing in that, that decimal point. If it's in the tens place. So in this case, there's no way of getting around it. You have to write it. You either have to explicitly write plus or minus 10, or you have to write it in scientific notation, where writing out that zero is there specifically to tell people that's where the uncertainty is. All right. Where am I? So the way that we we're going to get, get into, we've been just talking about uncertainty because that's a little bit easier to wrap our head around. Um, the other way we 
talk about how good a measurement is or how um, how many digits we're going to keep once we start doing math is talking about significant figures. And in general, once we get past today's lecture, we're going to talk about this entire unit as just as sig figs. It refers to both how many sig figs a number has and what the uncertainty is, or those are always tied together, right? Um, a sig fig is how many important decimal places are there in your measurement? How many numbers are there that you measure, either with certainty or with uncertainty? Right. So if you measured it, it's significant. You put effort into measuring it. If you wrote it down um, in your measurements, it's a significant figure, meaning um, it counts as to towards how precise your measurement is. All right, so counting significant figures winds up being really important when we start doing multiplication and division, especially. Uh, but it's basically how many of the decimal places we're measuring. So where is the uncertainty in this measurement here in 48 meters per second? Where is the uncertainty? What place? In the ones place, how many significant figures does it have? Two, there's two digits that were measured and the uncertainty is in the ones place. How about 343.29 meters per second? The uncertainty is in the hundredths place. And how many significant figures are there? There's five. So you count the one where we where it's estimated as well. It counts as one of those sig figs. I keep saying sig figs. I think our book actually calls them significant digits, but sig digs doesn't roll off the tongue quite as it sounds more confusing to me, at least, probably because I grew up with sig figs. Um, but it means the same thing. Significant digits, significant figures is just referring to how many of these places are measured. Five of them will measure. And the estimated one counts as a sig fig too. Because you put in effort into measuring it, you're not off by that much, right? You're off by at most 10% of that last digit. So it's still a good measured number, even if it's not as certain as the other ones. How many sig figs are in speed of light when it's written this way? Three sig figs. One, two, three. Where is the uncertainty? In the hundreds, while well, it's in scientific notation, right? So when scientific notation is where I'm saying where the uncertainty is, it gets a little bit tricky because it's plus or minus. Zero point zero one times 10 to the eight. Right, so the uncertainty is still in the last digit is also in there too, right? Because if we wrote this all the way out, it's three, yeah. Our uncertainty is in the second zero, right? The 0 0.01 times 10 to the eight is where our uncertainty is, or we're plus or minus a million meters per second. And that's about as hard as it gets when it comes to where is the uncertainty or how many sig figs there are, is when scientific notation is involved with the uncertainty, sometimes it can be a little tricky to, to actually write it. You have to either write it like this and make sure you include the power, or you can convert that and you can say it's plus or minus one times 10 to the six meters per second. There's a question over here. Yeah, usually like the parentheses, three point zero zero. That's a good question. Mathematically, yes. Um, that, that's something I've never seen before. So I would hesitate to do that. In general, if you're writing in scientific notation, you don't need to write the uncertainty, though. That's one of the draws for scientific notation, is it allows us to just write it like this instead and assume it's plus or minus one in that last reported digit in the coefficient. Is that eight a sig fig? 
to see some people saying no, why not? It's just an error that's telling you how many zeros are. It's just telling us how many zeros there are, right? If, if we could be off by an entire place here, if we're not sure, if we could be, it's it's 300 million plus, and it could be, but maybe it's 30 million or maybe it's 3 billion. Um, why are we even saying three at that point, right? Our uncertainty is at the level of, we don't even know what order of magnitude it is. So that doesn't count as a significant figure because that's just telling us where the decimal point is. And something that now it's probably confusing you even if you didn't think about it until I asked the question. Um, Sigmas are only in the coefficient in scientific notation. Hang on. Uh, all right. Just for more, more practice, we have this measurement 3.0 times 10 to the 2 inches. Where's the uncertainty? In, the, in this place right here, which is what in terms of non scientific notation? What's 3 times 10 to the 2? 300, right? So what's our uncertainty? In the tens place. So it's plus or minus 10. Right? Because, and if you're unsure about that, take that number, write it out. Three times 10 to the two is 300. And the uncertainty is in this place right next to the three. So the uncertainty is in the tens place. It could be off by as much as 10 mile inches, whatever that unit is that I made up. And the other reason we pay a lot of attention to this is because we need to know what the uncertainty is in our answers sometimes. We don't, in chemistry, I can, and I can't use an absolute. I tried to use an absolute, um, but it hurt too much. So, in chemistry, we almost never actually measure anything we care about directly. We're dealing with things that are so small, the numbers that are so big, we're never physically measuring anything um, on its own. It's always going to take that measurement that we have and then do some math with it to get to it something we actually care about in chemistry. So with that in mind, we need to know what to do when we have to do math with these measured numbers as well. And this is the part that people struggle with um, and that we're going to, and I will, I hope you prove me wrong this time. It's never been the case, but I hope this year is the year um, that the number one mistake that I correct for the entire quarter is sig base. Everything you turn in me with a number on it, I'm going to mark you down somewhere for sig base, almost certainly. I mean, it's not always a harsh, when it's more of a reminder, hey, remember to be paying attention to this, or hey, remember what that rule was. So a quarter of a point here, a quarter of a point there. Um, and it gets so monotonous that I don't even write sig figs. Even sig figs is too long to write out. I just write SF. Sometimes I just write minus a quarter and move on to the next page. I don't even write anything. You see minus a quarter of a point anywhere on anything I get back to, it's because of sig figs. Um, so you will mess this up. That doesn't mean we should try to do it right every time. And if you're, because if you're really egregiously wrong, I will start taking more than a quarter. If you didn't even think about sig figs, you just wrote out 10 decimal places from your answer. I'm, I'm going to take off maybe a whole point for that. And that's really bad. You should have written three decimal places and you wrote 10. You're saying your number is way better than it actually is. So, with that in mind, when we do math with these numbers, we have to have rules for knowing where to um, where to write. So adding and subtracting are the rules that are that make the most sense. These are the ones that um, it's not that hard to get the rules right for it. Basically, you just look at the numbers that you're adding and subtracting, and whatever has the largest uncertainty, that's the same uncertainty that your answer could have. Which again makes sense. If I tell, told you we'll use gas in a car again, um, if we told if I told you I bought five point two five five gallons of gas at stop A, and then I bought five gallons of gas at stop B, plus or minus a gallon at stop B versus a really, really small number at stop A. 
which means my final like, total answer could be off by an entire gallon, right? Whatever the largest uncertainty is when we're adding or subtracting numbers, your final answer is going to have that same uncertainty. And the other analogy that I use all the time is, is think about somebody, a friend from the Bay Area who's driving up here, um, and they've got, you know, their trip is going to take them 240 minutes plus or minus 10 minutes. And then they call you to tell you that they got stopped at Placerville at the stoplight, they're going to be 15 seconds late. Does that really matter? That doesn't change your estimate when they're going to get here, right? Because your uncertainty is already in the 10 minutes place. So what does that 15 seconds matter? Even if they properly report their sick face on their 15 second delay, 15 seconds plus or minus a second, who cares? You're plus or minus 10 minutes already, right? So when you're adding or subtracting, all you do is keep it in the same decimal place or the same, keep the uncertainty in the same digit as your least certain number before. So let's say we measured these two pieces of wood. We had 4.56 and 3.0. The uncertainty for these, for the first piece, is in the hundredths place, right? And in the and it's in the tenths place for the second measurement. If we add these together, when you plug it into your calculator, you're going to get seven point five six, right? Your calculator spits out seven point five six centimeters. But if we could be off by an entire tenth here, that means our answer could be off by a tenth. So where do we have to round? We have to, our final answer has to be to the to the tenth place because our larger uncertainty was in the tenth place. Right? So it trips people up a little bit um, to, to think the easiest way to think about it is to say you're going to keep the same number, some same number of decimal places as the least certain number. Um, but that trips people up if we don't have a number behind the decimal place. And the same rule applies if all of our numbers have their uncertainty in front of the decimal place. It just means that we're keeping it in the same digit, in the same place in terms of, of um, counting. All right, so easy enough, right? You have two measures, you're adding or subtracting them. That's what you're doing for your uncertainty. We could do some practice. I'm going to skip this for now. We will do this practice on Tuesday of next week uh, when we come back because I want to show you the other rules. So you've seen both of them for the weekend and then you can let it marinate and come back on Tuesday. So for the last six minutes that I have, uh, here's the criteria for sick vapes. Is that a good example? Um, let me wipe that out real quick. Hang on. It's a lot of text and I want to stop and talk about it before we get into the actual example. <laughs> Not that one. All right. When you multiply or divide your uncertainty, it's not as simple as saying your uncertainty gets multiplied or divided as well, because it just means the range of answers that you could have is based on, on how many sick things you had, not on where the uncertainty was before. And because the number of sick things you have tells you, okay, if I write down, let's say I write down 361 centimeters, the uncertainty is in the ones place, right? It's plus or minus one. I could be off by at most one out of 361, right? Which is a very small percent, less than 1%. Counting the number, if I did this, I can still, my uncertainty is still plus or minus one, but that's a much larger percentage of the total number, right? So with multiplication and division, we don't go by where the uncertainty started, we go by how. 
how many sig figs we had because that tells you what share of the measurement was on certain before. Right, so the rule changes to you keep the same number of sig figs as the number that had the fewest sig figs before. Right, and so that accounts for the fact that sometimes when you multiply these numbers get way bigger or way smaller than they started with. And that does, we don't want to keep the uncertainty in the same place as it was on either of them because our numbers are now way bigger than it was before. So when we do multiplication or division, you keep the same sig figs. So this one makes less intuitive sense, but it's easier to do in practice. It's, it's one of those, the way I remember this is there's the simple one that's hard to do, and then there's the the one that's really complicated to explain that's really easy to do in practice. You count how many sig figs you have, that's how many numbers you're going to write down on your answer. So let's say we had a box that was 12, 12.10 centimeters by 14.58 centimeters by 3.12 centimeters tall. If we want to know the volume of the box, length times width times height, we just multiply three numbers together. And uh, we get a calculator answer of 550.42416 centimeters cubed. We're not going to write down all the decimal points because that tells us our uncertainty is all the way over here. Even if we wanted to actually, if we um, had the uh, patience to write down that many decimals, that's not the right way to do it because our uncertainty is really going to be where in the final answer where are we going to round we're only keeping three sig figs because this number only has three sig figs we have four sig figs four sig figs and three sig figs so our answer can only have three sig figs so the way we'd write our answer would be 550 point or 5.50 times 10 to the two centimeters squared cubed, sorry. All right, so those are two rules. Addition and subtraction, you keep the same uncertainty as your least certain number. And multiplication division, you keep the same number of sig figs as your fewest sig figs. And with enough practice, this will become second nature to you, but I still correct my colleagues that work here on their sig base sometimes. So it's something everybody's always working on. You will struggle with it, but we're gonna get good at it. All right, have a good weekend. Don't forget to take a no new quiz over the weekend. Turn in any assignments this week if you haven't turned in yet. Um, they're not due until next week, but we have time until before. Thank uh -huh.